Hello and welcome to episode 30 and our third year anniversary of the Bike Karma Bicycle Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brown. While I should be riding and fixing up bikes to get them out of the house, I've also been assembling stories from the bicycle-loving world for you. This show is all about connecting bicycle-loving people from across the spectrum to share stories and make connections, hopefully bringing us together in a world sometimes pulling us apart. These are stories about the humans on and behind the bicycles. First, we follow Danielle Shun from Shun Studios, about how she went from studying arts to a job in the corporate world to learning to weld and build bicycles in an airfield in the mountains. Then, Emery Bikes from episode 29 sends out an all call for help spreading the word about their upcoming Kickstarter. Then, if you're familiar with the artist M.C. Escher, whose art inspired the famous scene in Labyrinth where David Bowie dances around moving stairs in an impossible castle, then you may like the way Weiss Manufacturing from Brooklyn builds their bike frames. Finally, friend of the show and founder of the Builder's Ball Bicycle Show in Boston, say that eight times fast, shares a story about taking his daughter too far on a bike trip. You have a lot of podcasts to choose from, and I really appreciate you coming along for the ride on mine. Let's roll out. So one of my recurring daydreams while I'm riding is that I'm back in time, somewhere after 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct, but before human civilization. And I'm out in the wild by myself trying to survive. One of the things I do eventually is I eventually try and think about making a bicycle. And making a bicycle is not really top on my priorities if I'm going to survive in the ancient world. But I'm trying to do it anyway. And I keep running up against, I need metal. I could build the whole thing out of wood. I could try, I even thought about making some things out of like glass or rock. But in the end, you really just need metal for some of the parts. There's really nothing else that'll do if you want to have a modern bicycle. So modern bicycles depend upon metal. So finding metal is hard. I'd have to mine it, then I'd have to extract it, and there's nobody around to help with that. So. Then I start thinking about how all of human society is defined in its development by the development of metal. So we go from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. These were huge milestones in the development of humankind. Not only finding metal, but refining it. I mean, metal, you don't find it in big chunks on the ground too often. You have to mine it and separate it and refine it and change it and then forge it with heat. It was such a big deal that the ancient Greeks and Romans had a god in their mythology specifically for forging metal. Hephaestus in the Greek or Vulcan in the Roman. And it was like his superpower to be able to work with metal. So just like how chefs go back to traditional recipes and farmers go back to heirloom varieties, people who enjoy understanding how bicycles work go back to metal craft. Titanium, aluminum, and the mother of all metals for bicycle craft, steel. If you've ever been flying down a hill at over 30 miles an hour and looked down at your bike and thought, God, That's kind of a thin type of material that I'm entrusting my life with. It looks like a few broomsticks that have been put together. I wonder if that's going to stay together. That little existential doubt that you felt transfers into a curiosity about how to stick metal pipes together to make a strong frame. So don't worry. 
If you come here for the stories, you are not going to be left behind on this one. It is not a technical discussion. It is a story. If you are a person at the very beginning stages of wondering how to change a flat tire so you can keep going, imagine that you're on a continuum with everyone else who's ever worked on a bike. You're at the beginning stages where you're wondering about how to adjust your brakes, how to make your flat not be flat anymore, and then as you gradually progress, you eventually get to a point where you start to put learning learning how to weld onto your list of things to do. And it's weird, it creeps up on you. Go into a room at a bicycle co-op, go into a mechanics area and ask who knows how to weld. You'll get a couple of hands going up and then you say, who would want to weld? And then you'd get more hands going up. And it's just something that happens. It's a direction you eventually get called to. It opens up a whole new doorway of creative possibilities. So if you are not anywhere near that road yet, this is a story about learning and the adventure of learning new skills. If you've seen that in your future, then this is a story about how one person went to find their way there. Welding is an art and a science, and Danielle Schoen from Schoen Studios in Canada definitely has a strong foot in both of those camps. Here's her story about going from a background in art to a steady job in the sciences to becoming a welder and somebody who makes beautiful bicycles and other metalwork. So I turned turned to my boss one day and told them that I was quitting to become a welder full time and they just kind of looked at me. Okay, my name is Danielle Sean. I'm from Toronto, Canada. S-C-H-O-N and there's an umlaut over the O. The correct Germanic way to say it is schön, but I say it the lazy English way and that's fine most of the time, but sometimes people will correct me on the, on the pronunciation and I'm like, I know, don't worry. I run a metal fabrication shop, Sean Studio, located in Toronto, and I do custom metal work, race bikes, art, and all sorts of fantastic things. Well, I come from a fine arts background, and even when I was like a kid, I was always drawing and crafting and making things with my hands and trying to just create. Like, I've been creating my entire life, and it's gone through different, I guess, mediums. Like, I went through, I was really into sewing and like fabric and like, material-based work when I was in high school. When I was growing up, I wanted to, like my dream job was to be a prop master for Cirque du Soleil because it was just like, I would go, my mom took me and my brother every year for Christmas and like that was like our family Christmas thing. And I was just blown away by like the costumes and the props and like all this like magic that people would just make out of nothing. It's just a person who's like, here's a concept, make a thing and they just like build all these beautiful things and I was always like just really I really just love that concept. So uh, after school after I went to OCAD the Ontario College of Art and Design for photography I just fell backwards into a super corporate unrelated job I was working in IT strategy management and it was actually just like I had just got out of school like broke college kid no idea what I'm doing with my life and got a job through a friend of a friend. It was, it was a really good job, like great company, great people. And it was really interesting, like as an art school kid to be thrown into this environment of like business people and CEOs and like all that kind of strategy management type of stuff. So it was fine for a while, but it was very draining in the sense that I wasn't doing anything creative. And I was very, like, I didn't feel good after a while just because I was a little bit of a life crisis in the sense where it's like oh I, like this is not a career for me this is a job and you have that fear of just becoming complacent and getting stuck in it and then being in it for so long that you can't get out and like just having this fear of like losing my whole creative side and like all that. So I ended up actually at that time going back to school night school for welding because I it was just something that I was always interested in and it was kind of one of those things where I was like, this is a cool thing that I could try and I can take one night class and if I hate it, I never have to do it again. And if I like it, I can keep doing it. And it was like, at least it'll be something that I can do and I still have the safety net of my full-time job and I can just go and like two evenings a week and try it and be making stuff and see how that goes. So I did one class and I really liked it and I picked it up really quickly and got like really good feedback from the instructors. So I did the next class and then I did the next class and then I basically accidentally worked my way through an entire welding diploma when I was still working full time. 
And then it got to the point where I couldn't do any further schooling part-time because I was moving more into um, like intensive training and I was advised by my instructors to look into NDT which is non-destructive testing which is like a kind of quality control aspect of it uh, and that's all that's all nationally certified and like full-time so you have to there's only three places in Canada you can have that training and it's like a rolling basis so it's only like two weeks a year at this place you either have to go to like fly out to Edmonton or Hamilton and it's a whole big process so so you were kind of getting taken with this flow and towards a destination yeah. that you didn't really pick, but it wasn't horrible for you. You kind of getting swept away. Yeah, and it was just one of those things where it was a difficult decision to make because it's scary to leave your safety net. And I was pretty young at the time. Like I was, I must have been like 21 or 22. It's like a big step to like and I was you know living downtown alone at the time Toronto's an incredibly expensive city and it's like okay well like how do I pay I'm just gonna quit my job and like go into this complete other industry and like I had to do the NDT certifications is like several months of training and testing and certification and then you have to find a job unless you are hired on somewhere as a trainee and then they'll send you out to do the testing it's a pretty tricky industry to break into so there was kind of this I knew there was going to be quite a few months of like unknown but ultimately it was just like I've I've been going down this path and I it's compounding and I like what I'm doing and it's just kind of like a new thing and I'm young enough that if this sucks and doesn't work out then I'll just do something else like why not give it a go <laughs> so I turned turned to my boss one day and told them that I was quitting to become a welder full-time and they just kind of looked at me and I also like I was in a, a position where I had like long-standing relationships with like clients, customers, um, you know, that I spoke to all the time and, and whatever. And I had to like call through my client base to be like, hey, like I'm leaving the company, like this is who you're gonna be talking to next. And like super friendly with a lot of people. So they're like, oh, really cool, like what are you doing? Like a lot of people moved around in the industry to different like companies and stuff. And I was like, I'm gonna go back to school to be a welder. And they're just like, what? <laughs> so I got a lot of interesting reactions from that. So I went and did my NDT schooling for a while and after that point was when I started getting into like frame building because through all that time I was like riding, like riding the city, racing, trying to get more seriously into road racing, but like had always just kind of had crappy bikes, like nothing amazing, like nothing special. And I was like, okay, well, this point in my life, I'm a certified welder. I'm pretty handy, and I've been kind of seeing that was like around the time that frame building was having starting to have a bit of a moment on Instagram. There were like a couple of builders that were like posting stuff before it really blew up. I was like, okay, I know this is a thing. So like, how how do I do this? Like, how do I figure this out? And I found out that Paul Brody, who is arguably the father of Canadian mountain biking, is based out west in Abbotsford, BC, was teaching. So I went out west to learn from him uh, and built my first road bike with him and it was basically just because I needed a road bike for myself and I really like had a great time he's a fantastic teacher he's just one of those people that is just so stoked on bikes and loves his craft and loves that you're there to learn the craft and is just so excited to share his knowledge with you and is just like son such an unbelievable wealth of knowledge in the sense that like you ask a question and without even thinking he'll give you this like just incredibly in-depth answer that has like so much more information that you even expected to get and you're just looking at them and you're like oh my god I hope I can remember like half of what you just said. But like I'm picturing you and a handful of other students mm -hmm. in the mountains. Outside. Honestly the the uh, the school is on an airfield uh, in Abbotsford BC which is like this tiny little valley town next to um, it's like super close to the American border. You're surrounded, like you can see the mountains. It's gorgeous. And I would bike, I would bike into the shop every day through farm fields and onto an airfield. And so it is like the Miyazaki film that I'm picturing. Yeah, it is, 100%. Wow. And it's like, it was me and two other people and Brody, and you're in the University of Fraser Valley Aerospace Engineering Center, which is an airplane hangar. And you're just like making bikes. It's so dope. 
So the, the course with Brody is only a couple weeks. They're basically intended to build you a bike and you work through, the, it's, a, it's a very basic approach mm -hmm. because it's supposed to be all, all encompassing in the sense that anybody could walk in off the street and you end up with a bike at the end of it. Some people approach it with the intention to, I'm gonna go, go learn from this person because I wanna become a frame builder. Some people go, Paul I remember told me, he's like, oh, we have like families come in and the class, like it'll be, you know, three people in a family for two weeks and it's just this really lovely experience of them all building bikes together and then they go to do bike touring together on the bikes they built, which is like really sweet. Or like myself, like I didn't go with the intention of becoming a frame builder. I went because I needed a road bike and I'm like, okay, I'm a welder, like I can do this. I'm pretty handy, like I like to figure things out. And the kind of the, the way that I've tried to move through my life is what skills can I acquire that will further the crafts that I want to do. So actually in school, you don't learn very much brazing. It's all like TIG and MIG and stick and like the industrial processes and like um, you do some like torch cutting, which is oxy fuel, but not a lot of welding schools really teach traditional brazing, fillet brazing anymore because it's not really relative to industrial process. And school is, welding school is industrial to get you into the industry, like working as a like a pipe welder or fitter or so whatever. artists in welding is a very It's not very really different. taught, yeah. It's a, it's a very different stream. I hadn't shirts. done really any brazing, so I was really interested in that aspect of it. So brazing is gas-based. There's gas involved in the other ones as well, but uh, you basically have a torch and you have your oxygen and acetylene, or some people use propane or a mix, a uh, flame. And it's a slower process because it's, it's technically a joining process, not a welding process because you're not melting the parent metals. So when you think of welding, you think of like the blue sparks and like the electricity and like the crackling. That's arc welding, that's either stick or TIG or MIG and those are um, electrical processes. When you're welding uh, electrically, in any electrical based process, you are m more often than sometimes you don't add a filler metal mostly you do. So you have your two pieces that you're joining and your filler metal. When you heat it all up together, all three of those pieces melt together in a pool and more or less become one piece. So brazing, it's like a like like soldering's older brother kind of higher temperature. You do not melt the parent metals. So the like the bike tubes basically so don't it's like putting melt. Pipes together you're nice. putting them together. You are melting a filler metal on top of it and it fuses the joint together but it does not melt the two parent metals. So that's kind of the fundamental difference between the two. And the interesting thing about brazing versus TIG welding is specifically for bikes is that it's a very buildable process, like physically buildable. You can build up a giant fillet with brass and then file it down into whatever shape that you want. You know, there's trade-offs and every frame builder has every opinion on which one is uh, safer and better and less dangerous for the metal and whatever. But so TIG welding is a higher heat application, but for a shorter time, whereas brazing is a lower heat application, but for a longer time. So I asked her which is better. There's infinite debates on all of that. It really comes down to it comes down to a lot of things. It comes down to your tubes, it comes down to the fillers that you pick, the quality of your fillers. Heat control is a huge one. If you could have, if something is fundamentally, if something has a lower tensile strength, let's say in filler and metal and whatever, but it's like a beautifully executed weld or braze, that's gonna hold up significantly better than maybe a filler or a material or whatever that has a higher tensile strength, but was just like, you dumped so much heat into it and the fit up's really crappy and like you just ruined the weld. Yeah, they all have, some of them are more appropriate in different applications and depending on what you're doing and you need like more tensile strength in different areas, like some are more recommended for different applications than others. But if you apply a process correctly and are considering like your torsional stress factors and where the weight is going and all that stuff, like one is not worse off than the other. As long as you're, it's, it's all comes down to like heat management and recognizing process and, you know, understanding your tubes and alloys and what heat does to metal.
it's impressive as a teacher. Mm -hmm. like, I wish you could come into my school and kind of be a role I'd model for to. my kids. Yeah, you know? I love, I, I really love talking to kids because, about this stuff. Because you've found a balance between the the artistic sensibilities, mm -hmm. the creative process. Trying to, and trying to. Being very, very scientifically clear-minded. Yeah. And the reason seems to be is that you found that fire in your belly mm -hmm. to do something in particular. Yeah. And that's the hardest part as a teacher is to- Like kind of incite like, that passion in people. If you are trying to get somewhere, yeah. I can totally help you. Yeah. I can give you a hundred thousand ways to learn yeah. something, to remember something, yeah. to apply yourself to something. But if you don't spend the time mm -hmm. finding where that fire might come from, no one can do that for exactly. you. Exactly. They can show you sparks, yeah. but you, it has to come from Yeah, lead a, lead a horse to water type thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's really difficult. Um, and like, not to say that I don't struggle with that still in my life. Like I have, I have a lot of, like a lot of my close friends are from art school and like working artists and stuff like that and we have these like existential conversations all the time where it's like what am i doing oh my god does anybody even care like does any of this even matter and it's like in an independent fabrication house is like i spend a lot of time by myself in a room making stuff and like sometimes it's hours and hours and hours and you're there for like days at a time just working on something and you get stuck in like a weird headspace of very disconnected from the world and then it's like oh does anybody even care like what am I doing like I'm making this thing when it comes down to it it's like it's just trying to trying to work through your own creative process and yeah it's that's the thing for me that has never changed throughout my entire life it's, it's about the creative process and making something and I don't know satisfying that part of myself and the medium in which or the application in which that I go through it can always evolve and change but I know fun fundamentally as long as that I'm trying to work on that within myself I'm at least moving in the right direction for me so I'm happy to know and whenever I'm like freaking out and don't know what I'm doing and whatever, I try to like take a step back and come back to that part of me where I'm like, am I doing this? Am I still trying? Am I still trying to fulfill my own creative needs and, and expression? Yes, okay, then keep going. And if I get into a situation where I'm not, kind of like when I was when I was working in a super corporate office, it's like, okay, that's when I need to steer myself back into the correct direction for myself. It's It's a process, right? And it's a learning curve and like, you kind of just have to go with the ebbs and flows of sometimes you're on track and you know what you're doing and it's amazing and you have that passion and everything's working out and sometimes you just don't know and that's okay too and you have to just like work through it slowly and that's something that I've learned through the tough times over the years so I think it's really interesting to talk to kids like that who don't know what they're doing or where they're going or have any idea of like even the options that are available to them it's okay that you know you're 17 and you, you have to apply to all these colleges and you have no idea what you're doing with your life and whatever because if you told me when I was in you know 12th grade applying for school that this is what I was going to be doing now I would have laughed at you I didn't even know what half the stuff was when I was in high school. Uh, there's a kids program, like a build a bike program in Toronto through Charlie's Free, Free Wheels, which does, uh, works with a lot of low income families and the kids come in and through like donated parts and the mechanics and the volunteers, they build a complete bike from start to finish. So they gain that knowledge of the mechanics, um, all the parts on a bike, they can do the basic service. And then some of the kids who are really great at the program can then get hired on as mechanics at the shop after. They go through Can Bike, which is like a city riding certification program in the city. So it's a lot of kids who maybe like have never been on a bicycle before. So they get comfortable riding in the city. So I've done a lot of work with them and they did a field trip to my shop and everybody got to try welding and to watch them like try. And all I did, like I just had scrap metal and they were just like running little lines on plates and it was like blowing their minds. And it was amazing to see, especially like the girls in the class were like, is this a thing that I can do? And I was like, yeah. Definitely, like this is for sure a thing you can do. And I got so many questions from kids being like, if this, like, what do I do? Like, how do I get into this? Like, this is, what do I go to school for if I want to do this? And I was like, it's super easy. Like, there's so much available to you that you don't even know. So it was really cool to have the opportunity to, like, maybe light that fire in someone else. Um, literally. Yeah. With. Yes, literally and figuratively. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Some of the kids are like, Am I gonna get electrocuted? Like, am I gonna light myself on fire? It's like, 
If you do either of those things, I would have yelled at you way, way, way before that point because you have to be doing something super wrong to get to that point. I think that's really important and really cool and really interesting to be able to maybe help other people, let other people know that it's okay to like not know what you're doing and just kind of like putter around and figure stuff out and like work through your own process. So yeah, that's been a really cool, like unexpected part of this whole experience for me, especially a lot of working with and speaking to women in trades has been really cool. Actually, someone, someone came up to me at the Toronto Bike Show a few years ago, it might have been three years ago, and I remember talking to her. She asked me a ton of questions about welding school and she like followed me on Instagram and she's like, oh, I love your work. This is so cool. I really want to get into this, but like, I don't know if I can do it. Like, I have no idea what to do, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, like here are the programs in the city. This is like, this is like kind of the easiest, most non-committal one to take, which was the same first welding class I took. I'm like, you can, you can go take one class and if you hate it, you never have to do it ever again, but it's worth a try. And I was like, of course you can do it. Like, just go, just go do it. Just go try. Like, who cares? Just... If you, if you hate it and you don't want to do it, then just don't do it. But like you owe it to yourself to just go try. And if you're concerned that like people are going to laugh at you or like say that you can't do it because you're a woman or whatever, like screw those people, who cares? And she was like, okay, cool. Like we had a nice little conversation and she came back to me. So it was a year later and she came up to me at my booth again. And she's like, I went to welding school because of the conversation that we had last year. And now I really love it. And I'm working towards becoming a welder. And I like almost started crying. I was like, oh my God, this is like the coolest thing that's ever happened that I could have the opportunity to like give someone else the like, yeah, like the drive to go and push through what they're trying to do. So yeah, that was really cool. That was a really cool experience. This is one of the conundrums that we were talking about pre-interview in life mm -hmm. what is success in life i don't know and who success knows success in life it's like you think to yourself well maybe if i publish a book i thought for a while that yeah. would be that would be my benchmark or yeah. if you get this many listeners or if you do this many bikes or if you do and it's really those moments mm -hmm. which yeah make up the mosaic of life for sure it's not a mountain as much as it's all these little hills yeah it's a journey right life. like that's the whole yeah. point um and like that's a really interesting point to bring up of like what is success how do you define success especially in the bike industry and especially in like being here at nabs in this like little niche corner of the market of this hand built custom artisan bikes it's like where how do you define that success it's like i don't know everybody that you talk to has a different definition and it's not to say that one is any more correct or incorrect than the other like what one builder wants to do and accomplish is completely different than what another wants to do like i don't really have the desire or intention to bang out 100 bikes a year i don't want to do that even like the first year that i started i was trying to do i just dumped full throttle into it and i was like i'm gonna be a frame builder like this was after i'd done all the welding i have my shop like this is what i'm this is the only thing i'm gonna do because i still have like i still work as a courier and i do like welding piece work and like just other shop work for other shops when i have to but when i first started i was like i'm not doing any of that i'm doing my own thing just bikes but then you have to you well you have to, like you got to pay your rent you have to uh, have your operating costs and do all that and it's just like I was building stuff that not that it was bad it was just I was saying yes to everything because I had to make bikes to pay the rent and I just was making stuff that I didn't love and I was making kind of like you know it was just simple bikes just bikes like not none of the like super creative like tiny intricate details and like lug work and the really creative drive side that I'm that is the focus for me now that's when I kind of took a step back and I was like because I had made a few bikes and like didn't even take any photos of them won't put them on my website because it's just not what I want to do and realistically it's such a small network and community is whatever whatever you put out is what you get known for so it's this catch-22 of if you're doing kind of all these simple straightforward bikes to you know pay the bills and whatever and that's what you're putting out then that's what you get known for and that's what people come to you for and you're like but, oh this is not what I want to make so I kind of took a step back and had to have an honest moment with myself where I was like I would honestly rather continue to work in other capacities where I can and do that kind of stuff and do more quality over quantity, but like in a sense, like personal quality over quantity. I wanna build the specific creative art bikes that I want to build, that I am conceptually happy with, 
and fulfill that creative desire in myself. If that means that I build one bike a year or three bikes a year or five bikes a year, that's fine. And then if that, you know, rolls forward and people see that type of work that I'm putting out and subsequently get the volume from that kind of work, awesome. If it doesn't happen, I'm happy to continue doing other things on the side to fill in the gaps where need be. So it's a learning curve. It's a process and like, it's not always easy. And for sure you second guess yourself all the time, um, but it's fun. Where would people go if they want to find out more about what you do? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram. You can go to my website, which is www.seanstudio.com or my Instagram, which is at Sean Studio. Great. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. It's been great. Emory Bikes are trying to do something amazing that not a lot of companies are. They are trying to build the most durable bicycle they can imagine. You can hear the story in episode 29. They are overbuilding a stainless steel, internally geared optional cruiser bike called the C4 to be a bike for a lifetime. In a world where so many products are disposable disappointments designed to fail, Clayton and the folks at Emory Bikes are trying to do the exact opposite. Rather than design a consumable product that will force you to upgrade or buy another in a couple of years, they are trying to make something sustainable that could last for a century or more. Instead of planned obsolescence, they are planning for long-term durability, and I am proud to have them as a supporter of the show. This is a grassroots effort to make something to be proud of, and they need your help. They're going to be launching a Kickstarter campaign soon for their rugged cruiser bike made in Florida, and they need help spreading the word. That's it. Just help us spread the word about what they're trying to do so that when they launch their Kickstarter, lots of bicycle-loving folks will know about who they are and what they're trying to do. So if you are a friend of the show, please take a moment to go to their website and check out the bike at emorybikes.com. That's E-M-O-R-Y-B-I-K-E-S.com. If you check out the bikes and their mission and you want to help spread the word, they might have some cool hats, t-shirts, and other stuff soon. Email them at emorybikes at gmail.com and mention you heard about them on Bike Karma. So to help both them and the podcast, please check out Emory Bikes on Instagram and Facebook and at their website at emorybikes.com. Any social sharing you can do to help get the word out is greatly appreciated. And once again, you can contact them at emorybikes at gmail.com. Thank you and back to the show. So one of the ways to check things on your bike to make sure everything's cool is to check that everything's even. But what if it wasn't meant to be even? That's what's so visually captivating about Weiss Manufacturing's bikes. The rear seat stays look like an optical illusion. They literally come into the seat tube at different places. And it just looks beautiful, like it's a painting by Escher or Magritte. The design is both whimsical and clean and apparently functional. I saw them at the Builder's Ball in Boston and also at the North American Handmade Bicycle Show in Hartford. This recording is from when I first met them up in Boston, so excuse the noise in the background. It was an exciting night. My name is Paul Bennett, Weiss Manufacturing. And you're from Brooklyn? Yep, we manufacture everything in Bushwick, Brooklyn. So the thing that struck me as I'm looking at these bikes is they have an asymmetrical seat stay. Can you talk a little bit about that and what was the thinking behind it? Yeah, so we basically did the asymmetrical rear triangle for better power transfer. These are you know, racing bikes. We have people racing in the Red Hood Crit on these and it makes sense to have the drive side where the drivetrain is be able to take more force when someone hammers on the pedals for sprinting. And it also enables us to lighten up the non-drive side where there's less force being applied. I mean, for somebody, myself, who likes to look at bikes, I mean, they're just beautiful. You know, you would think that having an asymmetrical product like that would make it seem off in a way, but it's more like an Escher thing where you're like, oh yeah, that kind of makes yeah. sense. What 
What got you to think of this? What was the thing that made you say, that's going to make sense? Um, I think it just intuitively made sense when I thought about how a bicycle works. But, I mean, it came out of a friend asking me to make them a crazy custom bike. And so I like there to be a little bit of reason behind everything I do. So I thought long and hard about it, and I thought this would be a cool idea. So over time, we've refined it, and you can see here is there's different iterations of the same design, but we kind of refined it and got the aesthetics down and figured out the right tubing and so on and kind of threw it together. I mean, you say that the performance is better and artistically it looks cool as heck. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of a mind bender a little bit. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I think it's visually very pleasing. I, I'm really into the asymmetry. Uh, yeah, I, that alone is, is like worked for me, but I, I do think there is a little bit of physics behind it too. If people want to check them out, where would they go? Uh, you go to our Instagram, which is WeissMFG, or you go to www.weissmfg.com. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. now a segment from friend of the show, Eric Weiss. You might remember him from such segments as What to Do When You Find an Orphaned Baby Possum on the Side of the Road, and our shared psychosis of imagining the bicycles talk to us, even though they're not. Or are they? Or is it in our heads? As our kids grow up and leave home and start to go to college and stuff like that, I look back and I think to myself, maybe I could have squeezed in a couple more rides with them on the trail of bike. But Eric shares a story today about one time that he pushed his daughter a little bit too far on a bicycle ride. My name is Eric Weiss. I live in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm a transportation planning consultant by trade, and I've spent the last 20 years helping towns from Maine to Florida become more bike-friendly and pedestrian-friendly. I'm also the director of the New England Builders Ball, which is the only annual bike show in this part of the country. The show returns to Boston on September 22nd of this year at the Innovation and Design Building in the Seaport District. My daughter has always loved riding with me, starting when she was about one on her little front seat between my arms. When she was four or five, she graduated to her Weehoo trailer, uh, where she was in a recumbent position, and she had her own drivetrain back there, so she could make as if she were helping me propel the rig. We commuted to preschool that way most days. The teachers really loved watching us roll up in style at the school in downtown Providence. The summer after she turned six, I asked her if she wanted to go bike camping with me, and she excitedly said yes. Her trailer bike had lots of cargo space, so I piled it high with our tent, sleeping bag, a thermarest, food of course, and the stuffed animals she insisted on bringing, and of course her blankie. Then we headed off with a few others on a 45 mile ride from Providence to Horse Neck Beach in Westport, Mass, where we would all share a campsite. We had a great time. We were singing songs together along our ride. Of course, we braked for lunch and then for ice cream and whenever there was a nice view. Finally, after seven hours, we reached our campsite, dumped our stuff and walked down to the beach to watch and listen to the waves for a little while before going back to our campsite to set up the tent and start supper prep. It was a quiet evening with singing and marshmallow roasting. She slept great that night. It was really an idyllic day. The next morning, I woke up first and crawled out of the tent to help with breakfast prep. After not too long, I heard some stirring, so I went back to the tent with a banana for my little girl. She was scowling at me. I asked her what was wrong. 
She looked up at me and said in a steady tone, Daddy, yesterday, I was so bored that I want to kill you. I decided to give her a few minutes. So I stepped away and I called my wife to ask her to come pick up our kid and drive her home, along with her trailer and our gear. What had taken us seven hours the day before took all of 45 minutes with the car. I biked home with my friends, uh, with a much lighter load, of course, and with my daughter's words echoing through my head. I was really glad that I had managed to keep from laughing when she spoke those words. Respecting her anger is really important. We made up that evening, and she even agreed to try another bike camping trip, but only if we cut the mileage in half. Perhaps this fall, I'll finally get around to planning that trip. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of the Bike Karma Bicycle Podcast. I'd like to, as always, thank Keller Glass and the band Mobjack for our opening and closing music. You can go check them out at mobjackmusic.com and probably everywhere else you can look for music. Thanks also to our guest, Danielle Schoen from Schoen Studios in Canada, Paul Bennett from Weiss Manufacturing in Brooklyn, New York, and Weiss Manufacturing is spelled W-E-I-S. And I don't believe there's any relation to our other guest named Weiss, which is Eric Weiss of the Boston Builders Bicycle Ball. The Bicycle Builders Ball from Boston. The Boston Bicycle Ball Builders of Builders. And that is on September 22nd at the Innovation and Designs Building in Boston, Mass. If you are in the area, go check it out. It's a fun party with people who love bikes and people who make bikes and things for bikes. Go check it out September 22nd up in Boston. And once again, thank you for the support from Emory Bicycles. Go check them out. The C4 is a pretty cool looking bike. But most importantly, I'd like to thank the people who've downloaded over 19,000 times in all 50 states and over 50 countries. Yes, I see you in Finland, Hepa, and down in New Zealand, Kiora, and thanks for listening. Hope I said those right. And I'm still looking for just one listener in Greenland to shade in that section of the map, but I'm patient, and I'm also patient for you, Oprah. I'm going to wait forever until I get that phone call or email about you wanting to share your bicycle story with me. Can't wait. Whether you're Oprah or not and you want to help the show, please leave a review on any of the podcast sites. It's greatly appreciated. Like, share, follow, all that social media stuff is always appreciated. And sincerely, thank you for that. If you have any feedback or you have any story ideas for the show, you can contact me at bikekarmaguy at gmail.com. That's bikekarmaguy guy at gmail.com and you can also email me there if you have a product that you think is a good fit for the show the bike karma podcast is the intellectual property of tom brown all rights are reserved including copyright trademark and all that stuff so hey everyone taryn's back from summer camp a little bit early taryn did you know that there are some people who don't check over their bikes before they go on a ride oh my gosh no, for real. You mean they don't do an ABC quick check? Right? Can you believe some people don't do that? Well, I don't want to lose any of my listeners. So every time before you go on the bike, do an ABC quick check, which is to check the air in your tires, your brakes to make sure they're going to work, your chain line to see that everything's going to mechanically be all right, and then your quick releases to make sure that somebody didn't flop them playing a joke on you or they didn't get pulled on something when you took them in and out of the car, or... Maybe someone's trying to kill you. What's that red dot? <laughs> <laughs> no, you want to check all that stuff, and then you want to check over your bike and make sure that it's okay before you go heading off down a big, giant hill. Do your ABC quick check each and every time you ride. Get in the habit of it, because even myself, after years and years and years, can forget some of that stuff. Well, thanks for coming along for the ride on this episode of the Bike Karma Bicycle Podcast, and until next time... Keep it square. What? Try it again. 
keep it wheel.